a struggle with how to respond to the tragedies that we seem to he hear much of in the news as of late. I was talking to a friend of mine, John Hampton, pastor down near St. Louis. He is a uh, Good friends with two rabbis who serve the Temple Israel, a Reformed Jewish synagogue, and um, I'm in awe of how some people are responding. The, the synagogue they gathered for worship yesterday, even though they have been receiving death, death threats daily for years, they always have to have armed guards when they gather, and uh, they have a bomb shelter in their synagogue. I guess that's just where they're at. They, and they gathered for worship yesterday. I'm, I am in awe of the bravery of some as they respond. In the last two weeks, we have seen uh, 13 pipe bombs sent to politicians, none of which went off, thankfully. Two African Americans killed in Kentucky in a supermarket after a white supremacist tried to get into a local predominantly black church, failed, and went to this supermarket and shot the uh, two African Americans he could find. And then 11 Jews were killed at the Tree of Life synagogue during worship last weekend. And I opened Google News, because I always wanted to get my facts right, and uh, to look up how many pipe bombs, because I knew there were more than I thought. And I opened up Google News last night to check my facts, and I saw at the top of Google News that uh, two women had been killed and five injured at a yoga studio in Tallahassee, Florida, by someone with a long history of misogyny and uh, hate. That was... There's an old adage about preaching, an old story, or an old uh, image passed down to pastors that uh, you preach with your Bible in one hand and the newspaper in the other, and you've got to hold those two together. And I've known for a while that the news has been reporting these things, and I need, uh, need to say something, dare to speak. I didn't plan on having so many happen all at once, obviously, but it is the moment to say something. We need to say something out of our faith together, out of the words of Scripture, for otherwise we yield to the temptations. And there are two temptations when responding to tragedies, and you're probably familiar with both. One temptation is to follow the script. You know the script. You know, right? When's the last time you heard a politician respond to multiple people dying and been surprised? Anyone? Like, I want to know. And I want you to tell me about it if it does happen. Right? Because there's, there's a set of scripts that, that are, we follow. And if there was a gun involved, we, we know that we're going to hear we either need more gun control because we've got to stop people from having guns, or we need to have less gun control for the only thing that stops a bad guy with a gun is a good guy with a gun. Like, we know these store, the way that this unfolds. We know the, the lines. I mean, we need more support for mental health because people choose to do this, or we need more ability for the police to get involved. And, and this applies not just for tragedies involving guns, but in natural disasters. We, FEMA needs to be beefed up, so more national control and help. No local agencies need to have more say. Like, there are, there's a set of scripts that unfold that, that we just walk through them again. And there's the other temptation, which is, I will just confess, what I've been falling into this last month or so, is the checkout approach. I, I have been listening to uh, a long, like 24, ser uh, 24 lecture series on the history of Middle Ages Italy. I've been loving it, right? I just, Olivia walk in, I'm listening to something on 14th century Venice, and that, that's like completely checking out. <laughs> the temptation either way leads to the same place, though. Either blaming those folks, right, the scripts, like if, if we go through the scripts and we do the same thing we always do, that, that allows us to blame them, right? If only those people, and you know who those are, right, it's the people you disagree with, if only those people would do X, we would be able to handle it, but since not, I just, I can't do anything, or uh, we just, just don't do anything because we're not involved. We just go back to lecture 17 on uh, Genoa. Let me risk, though, a few thoughts to propose something different, something formed by our faith, something formed by Scripture. Let's start with the book of Job. You all know the book of Job? Job starts out with one guy having a very, very bad day. And from there, uh, three friends show up and they argue at length. And then God shows up and, and says a few things, and that's the structure of the book of Job. And there's a moment in, in the book, book of Job, it's only a few verses long, that I missed for years, reading, reading through it. 
I read through the book of Job and it caught me. It was one of those moments where you, you read it and you go, whoa. And you shut the book and you push it back and you just sit there because you've just, it's, a, it's got you. Right? And here's this moment. Now when Job's three friends heard of all the adversity that he had come upon, they came each one from his own place. Elphaz, Bildad, and Zophar. Amazing biblical names. I love that, those. Elphaz, Bildad, and Zophar. And they made an appointment, an appointment to come together and sympathize and comfort Job. And when they lifted up their eyes at a distance, they did not recognize him. You ever walk into a hospital room and think you've walked into the wrong room because you look at him and say, that can't be, but it is? That's what's happening, right? They don't recognize him. They raised their voices and wept, and they tore their robes and threw dust of their heads towards the sky. And then they sat down on the ground with him for seven days and seven nights, with no one speaking a word, for they saw that his pain was very great. Afterward, Job opened his mouth, and he begins to speak. These three friends show up, and they have a lot to say. Just in case you haven't read Job lately, right? it's 42 chapters long. They start having this ongoing argument, like Job saying, I didn't do it, and the friends saying, no, you must have done something to deserve this. And they start, for 42 chapters, they have like <coughs> this never-ending argument about why this has happened and who deserves it, what's going on. But before they start arguing, before they debate, before they start hashing through it, they sit down, and they shut up. And they just sit and they, uh, lady over at Honeywell gave me uh, the, the, a good way to sum, sum the summation of this. It's far classier than what I say. Uh, the three H's, uh, hush, hear, and hug, which I think is pretty good, right? Hush, hear, and hug. Far classier than me saying to shut up. Don't talk, just listen, right? And that's hard for me, because what do I do? I talk. That's my job, is to use words. And, and to show up and just listen is a challenge. I'm I, I, struck by this. Um, it took me years to realize or to be taught. This is actually a Jewish practice. It's called sitting shiva. If, if in the Jewish culture, if you are struck by grief, something happens, friends show up and they sit down and they don't talk till you talk because you're the one in pain and you are the ones who, whose words matter. What strikes me is uh, when tragedy strikes, those who have been hurt need to be heard first. Right? Instead of rushing off to say the same thing that has always been said, first we listen. We don't have to agree, but first we listen. I don't know any Jews who were shot or any family of Jews who were shot in Pittsburgh. I, I don't know any of these families of the other things, but we live in the age of Google. I am never more than two clicks away from finding Jewish response to Pittsburgh. Like you can find what people, how people are responding. Go and listen before we do anything else. So first, listen. The second thing around how we respond to tragedies is to look at how people learn. There are individuals who made decisions to kill people these last two weeks, and they are their individual decisions, and they're going to be held up, they're going to be uh, tried, and they, and I believe they will probably be convicted, and they will be held responsible for their acts, and I will never not say that. People are held, we are to be held responsible for our individual acts, and yet we also must acknowledge that people are taught. People are taught. Right? The guy who uh, shot women in, in Tallahassee, um, there's this growing online movement, and the term they call themselves by is an incel, involuntary celibate. And I, I heard that term, and I think to myself, your anger at women because you're an involuntary celibate, my, my response would be treat women with respect, forget about sex. Just, just treat women with respect, and whatever happens after that, let, just treat people with respect, right? Your anger at women because you're an incel. Grow up, right? But that's what people are, are being taught. And you go through the, the, these groups, like people had to be taught to be racist. People have to be taught to this Jewish synagogue my friend knows of, a, a temple in uh, 
in, in St. Louis. Like someone had to, te they're getting work calls every day with words that, that I'm not going to say in the pulpit. They might begin with K, you fill in the rest, right? They had to be taught that, right? Politicians, we have to, we have to be taught that political action, that violence is a valid form of political action, right? We aren't born ready to hate blacks and women and Jews and politicians. We have to be taught that. And so we are taught that by groups that are lying. Right? That's what it is. There are groups that gather and they lie. They say things that are wrong. And I, it's not like I can go... <laughs> I can go online to one of these groups that, that preach hate against black folk, and it's not like I can show online and type, my name is Andy, I think you should love black folk, and all of them will say, oh, you're right, Let me, it's not like I can go up to some, a group and say, I think you're wrong, they're going to go, you're right, Andy, I'm just going to reconsider my entire life view because you think I'm wrong. But what we can do is tell the truth. What is the truth? The truth that in Christ there is neither male nor female, Jew nor Greek, slave nor free. That's the truth. That's it. That's what we believe. That is what we practice. That is what we experience. Attacking someone based on gender is sin. Attacking someone based on ethnicity is sin. Attacking someone based on, on the, that slave or free, a social construct, is wrong. The Jews are God's chosen people. That's what they are. Since that's all it says throughout Scripture. I cannot go to groups and, 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 sit and just like tell them, and they're going to go, oh, you're right, Andy. But what we can do is to tell the truth as best we know it and live in such a way that those who realize that they need something better are welcome. Right? Live in such a way that this church is a place where people can come and confess that they are wrong and they need something better and to offer it to them. So we respond to tragedy first by listening, then proclaiming the truth the best we can. And third, well, let me tell you a story. You might remember that September 11th, 2001 was on a Tuesday. It was on, that's, it was on Tuesday. And at Duke, at the Divinity School there, at the seminary, they have worship on Wednesday. The entire, all, all the preachers and seminary professors and biblical scholars and theologians and, and students gather together on Wednesday at 10 a.m. to worship, to pray, to preach, to have communion. What do you preach the day after 9-11? A very serious question, like, what do you do? And so an email was sent out to all the staff, and I'll tell you the guy who had the answer was uh, Rick Lisher. And the reason he had the answer, because he reads the Psalms every morning. He reads three Psalms. That's his, his biblical sort of practice. And, and he, is, he said to the class I was in, he said to me, you know, Andy, I feel like I should be reading more of Scripture, but this is what I do. This is what works for me. I read three Psalms every day. And the Psalms are the right thing to pray, to read after a tragedy. Let, let me read you a Psalm. This is Psalm 6. O Lord, do not rebuke me in thine anger, nor chasten me in thy wrath. Be gracious, for I am pining away. Heal me, for my bones are dismayed, and my soul is dismayed. O Lord, how long? Return, O Lord, rescue my soul. Save me because you love me. There's no one to talk about you in death. Who's going to praise you in hell? I am weary. Every night I swim in my bed in my own tears. My eyes waste away. I have become old because of my adversaries. Depart from me, all you who do iniquity, for the Lord has heard the voice of my weeping, has heard my supplication, and received my prayer. My enemies shall be ashamed and dismayed. They shall turn back, for they shall be ashamed. The Psalms are, are the prayer book of the church, and, and we don't preach from them often, and maybe that's on me. I, I don't know. But they are how we learn to pray and pray honestly. This is a praying like Job prayed. If you read the book of Job, the 42 chapters, it, it takes a while, but you notice a change. At first, God, Job is arguing with the three friends, because one of the three friends will say, Job, this is why it happened. You did this. You deserve it. And, and Job would respond, no, I didn't do it. I don't deserve it. And the three friends would keep on arguing back to him, Job, you deserve this. And, and Job went from wagging 
pointing his finger at his friend saying, I don't deserve this. To God, I don't deserve this. Right? You read through Job, it, it shifts. And it, it, Job is doing what the Psalms do. The first word of every Psalm is Lord. All right? I'm talking to you, God. You listening? The honesty of the Psalms, their bracing bluntness, train us how to pray. They train us to be honest and to make claims upon God, upon God's love, that God's commitment will be true. And we pray for God to hear our prayer. I think prayers are the third part of our response after a tragedy, and it is a hackneyed response. What is the four words that everyone says after a tragedy? My thoughts and prayers. Right? Anyone else get to have an allergic reaction to that? It annoys me. It annoys me to no end. Every time I see someone write that on Twitter or, or say that, my thoughts and prayers, I just I get angry. Because I feel like it's a cop-out. Because the ones who are saying it are usually the ones who maybe could do something about it. And yet, for us, it's true. We pray. Our prayers protect us from tragedy every single day. Not all of us, but most of us. Prayer is our response to death and poverty and hate and evil and even terrorism. For in praying, we become people who love each other. And I'm not talking about that warm and fuzzy. Like warm and fuzzy is great. I'm talking about practical, humble service. Love. Every time we gather to worship, we pray and we confess. We forgive. And in doing so, we are people, we confess the small things so the small things don't become bigger. We confess that we lie here over the small things so that the lies don't become bigger and such we end up cheating on our spouse because we're getting, we've gotten so used to lying, right? We confess the small things here. We confess when we have cheated in small ways so that we don't go down the path until we found ourselves having burned down a house for insurance fraud. We pray and confess when we have hurt those who are around us so that we do not end up as those who hurt the others who are different. We pray over water when we gather around baptism and that's what gathers and makes us family. And then we pray over this table and we welcome all. This water makes family that didn't exist. Look, look around at the people around you. Seriously, just look around. How many of these people would be your family if it wasn't for baptism? How many of these people would you know? And yet, because we pray over these waters and we are bound together by the grace of God, y'all are family. And you come to this table, and this is an open table, and this forms this family to welcome everyone. Always. Our prayers make us a people who are safe to be with each other. Right? They protect us. They change us. They're formed by the stories of our faith. The stories of snakes and floods. The stories of family and journeys of, of slavery and release. The stories of exile and return. These stories of brokenness and forgiveness and acceptance form us into the people who care. Who could not conceive of attacking each other due to gender, race, faith, or politics. We also pray as people who know the end of the story. We pray as people who know that we are headed towards the kingdom of God. And this space, this time, is practicing heaven. This is a foretaste of the kingdom when all will be made right. The tragedies will not stop. There will always be tragedies. And they will not stop until we arrive at the kingdom of God that is to come. But until that day comes, as someone who reads scripture and the newspaper together, I am convinced that we are to listen like Job, to proclaim the truth of our faith, and to pray towards the kingdom when all our family. And if we can do something else, we will, but we can always do this. Listen, 
tell the truth, and pray. Amen. Please stand and join with me as we confess our faith.